I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 79 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 079. Well, I've been super busy this week. I really haven't had time to prepare a show because, well, I'm still dealing with snow. Not so much as I was before, but there is still a bunch of snow around the area. I still have snow that's kind of turned into ice in my yard still. Just to show you how bad it is here in West Texas, this stuff happened before New Year's, and here we are on <laughs> here we are on January 11th, <laughs> and we still have snow. This does not happen in West Texas. I'm sorry. But anyways, I'm recording here in Gaines County, which is where I live and work. I've had a couple of listeners, or I don't know if they're listeners, but they have like the Facebook page. And these folks, uh, there's at least two people from Gaines County that have liked the blah, blah, let me get my tongue untied. There's been at least two people from Gaines County like the Facebook page. And I like to welcome people from my home county. If they are listening, well, more power to you. And this episode's kind of geared towards an issue in their community. But before we actually get to the episode, which is for the most part unplanned, well, I want to touch on the carry tip. And this episode's carry tip is going to be based on open carry. And that carry tip is dress professionally, be polite, and make a good impression. With that said, I want to run the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on the internet. And then we'll come back and we'll do some listener feedback. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Alrighty, we are back from that little audio clip break, I guess you'd call it. I don't know. People like to compare podcasting to radio and in all honesty the only thing they have in common is you have somebody with a microphone talking that's it some podcasts do uh try to emulate radio as best they can some podcasts try to just be themselves uh let the podcaster be themselves me this podcast is actually an extension of my personality with that said i always like feedback and i've got two here that i picked out on the feedback these are ones people said they actually indicated in their initial email, hey, you can use this. The second one, the email address was non-existent where it was sent from, so somebody put a fake address in their email program. But I'm going to address it anyway. And then we'll get on to some others I'm going to read at random from the inbox. First off, do bullets really travel up when fired or do they immediately drop? The answer to that is it depends. It all depends on how the barrel is positioned relative to the earth. If the uh, sight or scope plane is level and it's installed properly, the barrel will be tilted up slightly so the, when the bullet leaves the barrel, it will leave in a ballistic arc. It'll travel up a little bit and then it'll start dropping. If the barrel is parallel to the earth or uh, the end of the barrel is lower than the receiver, then you run into the bullet dropping immediately. Basically, it's very, very simple physics. In fact, it's uh, it's a, you can actually f uh, do the math relatively easy, and it's more like physical science is what they used to call it. I don't know what they call it nowadays in the high school program. It's been quite some time since I've been in high school, but it really depends. If your barrel is uh, if your barrel is uh, elevated so that the end of the barrel is above the receiver then the bullet will travel up when it leaves the barrel. It will not travel vertically. and It will not travel purely vertically. It'll have a slight inclination, so it will rise. And then you have a number of things that come into play. The spin on the bullet should make it climb a little bit if you're shooting far enough. It's all physics and math and all that. I'm not going to go into it and give you the full scientific lecture, but go outside, make sure you have a safe place to do this, pick up a rock and throw the rock perfectly level to the ground. As soon as it leaves your hand, there will be a component of downward motion. This is caused by gravity. Now you throw it up in a slight arc, it will travel up slightly. 
until gravity takes over and starts pulling it down. The entire time that both of these are happening, the rock is moving away from you as well. You can calculate the various components of this using trigonometry. But like I said, this is all math, science, and stuff that it would take a little bit of it would take a little bit of time to explain it to those that don't have a background in it, and those that do, well, they don't want to hear me go through it, so we won't do it. The next email I want to touch on specifically, and I'm not going to read the email account or the username that they claim to have. It's kind of vulgar. The email's one line. Can you prove what you say about OCT or is it just a lie? The answer is, I don't say anything that I cannot prove. I can go back. I can pull screenshots that have been emailed to me from the private groups. I can go back. I can throw email out there that I've received from members of the private groups. I can pull screenshots from their main website. I can pull audio where CJ has said this or that on various programs. I can do all of that. It's not me that's out here lying. And since we're on the subject of CJ Grisham, I did get an email from someone in one of their private groups where he settled the question that caused the rift between me and him that pretty much uh, ended any kind of a working relationship we had between myself and Grisham and or Open Carry Texas. If you go back to his visit to Oklahoma, he's he was photographed, and these photos were thrown up on Open Carry Texas's website. They had a image that, you know, they went out there, they did this, Moms Demand Action, or one of the other little Bloomberg-funded groups took the images, and they said, well, C.J. Grisham cannot have a Texas CHL, and he's openly carrying in Oklahoma, and the insanity of it is, even though police know this, they cannot ask him for his license because of Oklahoma law. Well, I'm not that familiar with Oklahoma law. I do know people that are familiar with Oklahoma law, and I could call them up and get them to talk about that, but we don't need to. I confronted CJ about it. I mean, I had a whole episode about it, and this caused a uh, pretty big rift between us. Suddenly, I went from friendly to open carry and unlicensed carry to anti-constitutional. I'm still trying to figure out how I can be anti-constitutional. It's like saying somebody's anti-oxygen. You got to have oxygen to survive. And for me, the Constitution is the same way. I got to have the Constitution to survive. But anyways, back on the topic. This is part of the logic that caused the Dutton Amendment to be uh, to be such a high target for people to get rid of. This is why the governor. This is one of the things that factored into the governor telegraphing a veto threat on Twitter for House Bill 910 if the Dutton Amendment was left in it. Well, I get an email from somebody. They're in one of Open Carry Texas's closed groups, and I open the email, look at it. Oh, there's an image, and the image is a JPEG. First thing I do when I get an email that has a, any kind of attachment, I save the attachment, and then I thoroughly check that that attachment out. I'm a computer guy, and I know the kind of risk email attachments pose. Anyhow, I take the email attachment, save it, check it out. It's a JPEG. There's nothing malicious about it. And I still put it in a separate account and open it. When I get it open, I notice something odd. There's a picture of a badge. It's a uh, one of these pop block badges, uh, something about shiny badges don't grant extra rights, yada, yada. But off to the side is a picture of a law enforcement. Uh, it's not a law enforcement. It's, it's an ID that's issued by Texas to people who are qualified to carry under LEOSA, but do not get qualified by their by the agency that they carried under before and it has CJ's picture and his name. Well there you go. That's all he had to do was he had to all he had to do was let people know that. He could have saved the Dutton Amendment if way back when this whole thing about Oklahoma blew up, if he would have provided that then, he could have saved the Dutton Amendment. I almost guarantee it. He might have brought a lot of fire on the Law Enforcement Officer Safety Act, that's a federal law. He might have brought fire on that for allowing him to carry, but he would have drawn a lot of attention away from the issue that he caused that kind of made a problem getting the Dutton Amendment. Moving on, I now have my email client open. We have somebody asking for more information about the drone UAV UAS slash RC aircraft slash uh, quadcopter. Well, let me go into a little bit of detail about that. I was mistaken. I actually plan to address this. Texas law is not nearly as draconian as I thought it was. I'm still researching it. I'm still going into more detail. 
but it's not as draconian as I thought it was. I may do an episode on UAVs in the future and how they can be used with gun rights. I don't know. This is something I am going to need to look at and decide on then. Okay, moving on. A lot of emails about the presidential executive orders. I'm not going to touch on that. There's plenty of gun advocate podcasts out there that will touch on it. It's It does affect Texas, but it's well covered, and there's more that can be touched on than that. Now, let's see. The mental hospitals. Uh, yeah, I'm, oh, and our news, our news girl, I know it's going to upset her. I'm going to call her Sandy this week. I don't think I've used Sandy yet. Anyways, we're going to call her Sandy. Anyhow, Sandy sent me a big old long list of email stories to look over. And instead of paring it down to six like I had planned or three like normal, I pared it down to two because I want to touch on guns and businesses in the news. That's it. The mental hospitals, um, that's a bunch of, that's a bunch of anti-gun nuttery. And that's a nod to the gun blog variety cast there. Anyhow. Oh, and if you don't listen to the gun blog variety cast, I recommend it. Anyhow, what I'm getting at is you have a law that basically makes hospitals off limits if proper notice is provided. If proper notice is not provided, you can legally carry openly or concealed into the hospital. Uh, Not a problem, but the anti-gunners are losing their minds over this. In her email, uh, what did I call her? Sandy. In her email, Sandy said that uh, she actually had, uh, she had, uh, nearly a hundred stories on this that we could use, and we're not going to use them at all. Sorry, Sandy. Now, for those who have just tuned in, Sandy is not her real name. She doesn't want me using her real name, and rather than calling her the news girl, which uh, doesn't just feel right. I'm sorry. I make up a name for her. However, moving on, I'm going to run the audio clip that tells us tells you how to find the show on social media, and then after that, I'm going to come back. And we want to talk about our main topic. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google Plus, And you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. And we're back. So let's talk about let's talk about courthouses. One year ago, no gun signs did not mean anything in a multifunction building unless it was a thirty out six and it was on an area that was already off limits under the under forty six oh three or forty six oh three five. You could conceal carry into places that are not off limits unless proper notice was given. A few locations uh have to be posted. Places where meetings are taken taking place unless they are a courtroom. A number of courthouses are saying, a number of counties are saying their courthouse is strictly for court-related business. And they're thumbing their nose at the legislature. Looking into this a little further, a lot of courthouses in my area are not going to allow the legal carry of firearms, including the Gaines County Courthouse. Now, if you didn't listen to the start of the show, and you just skipped over some of that, I live in Gaines County. I have an issue with this. Not that I go to the courthouse very often. In fact, I very seldom go to the courthouse. However, our commissioner's court, I'm recording this on January 11th, which is a Monday. They had their meeting. I came in. I sat down. I spoke to some of the commissioners before the meeting. Gave them all a little presentation I had. It was kind of where I sat down and went through my thought process, looked over everything. And now that I've heard their debate on the issue, I understand where they're going with it, and I understand why they're doing it, and I also understand what's going to happen. However, let's consider this. The Texas Attorney General issued an opinion. It was KP-0049, and it said basically a multifunction building is not off limits in its entirety. This means that if you have a courthouse and you have a place in there that does something, I don't know, like driver's license, or maybe they take money to give you your license plate, which would be your tax assessor's office. These places are not offices of the court, so these places have 
to how's how's the best way to put it? These places have to be available uh, for legal carry. And it all boils down to Texas Penal Code Section 46035, where we have our definition of premises. The key words here are a building or a portion of a building. Now, there's some history in that, in those very words. It's not my history to discuss. I will not discuss it. But there's a little bit of history in how those words got added in to, how some of those words got added in to the definition of premises. And it's kind of a critical thing that we consider the nature let me move that again. I'm moving some stuff around on the desk. I'm sorry. If, if In fact, you may even hear drag across the desk a little bit. But uh, anyways, those words are critical to what's going on. A lot of these uh, counties are thinking a building, they can use the whole building as being off limits because of it. A lot of people that are involved in gun rights are saying the portion of a building means just that small portion. Well, the attorney general was asked. He came out with an opinion. I have not. I've skimmed over it, I've read it, but I haven't gone and worked through the logic of it yet. So I'm not going to comment on that, but my understanding, just reading over it, multi-use buildings are not off limits in their entirety, just the portions that are courts or offices of the courts and the other areas that are off limits under statute. Well, the county commissioners here in Gaines County, uh, well, in fact, the county judge, while they were discussing this, uh, points out that uh, all these offices in the courthouse are subject to court orders. And this somehow makes them offices of the court. And I didn't say anything about this, mostly because I had other things I needed to touch on. But if being subject to a court order makes an office in the courthouse an office of the court, then does that mean a deadbeat dad that has not paid child support and is under court order to pay that child support is an officer of the court in the courthouse? I mean, that's the logic they're using. If you're under a court order to do something in the courthouse, you're part of the court. I don't buy it. I don't buy it at all. However, that's part of their logic. Another part of their logic is the county judge and the two judges that uh, hold court in the courthouse can sign off on a finding that makes the whole courthouse uh, a court premises. So basically, you're going to have three judges sign off on a on a finding where the courthouse is, in its entirety, a court. Last I checked, this was not the case. Moving on from there, we do have a few other issues. You see, I'm kind of working on migrating them away from it, this logic where we got to ban the guns. While I was there, I kind of pointed out that mm, there's there are no gun signs that they have on all the doors are as valid today as they were one year ago. The only thing that's been added into the mix is open carry. And the thing about the gun signs they have on the doors, they don't mean anything to a licensed carrier. And I pointed that out. And then I went and I discussed the, I also discussed the cost of (laughs) ignoring the attorney general's opinion and the prohibition on posting off-limits locations or uh, improperly posting locations as off-limits. I explained the process, how it worked. I had to notify them. After a time period, uh, then I could notify the attorney general if the issue hadn't been corrected. They would investigate, and then they would send notice to that offending court or courthouse or, you know, that government body. They would send notice, and then that body would have 15 days after receiving notice to take action to correct it. After that 15 days, the fines start. The first day, it was 1000 to $1,500. The second day, 10000 to 15000 And then I explained that they have three doors that I know that they'll probably post. I didn't mention the little service elevator, but they'd have to post it too. However, the posting of these doors would mean three doors posted, and if it takes 31 days for them to get this resolved, and if they're found to be in violation, they would have spent a minimum of $900,000. Do you know what happened to all the eyes at the commissioner's court table? They went from the size of quarters to the size of silver dollars. 31 days, $10,000 a day, with the first day being $1,000. I don't know if the courts would treat only one sign as an initial offense or if they'd treat all three signs as an initial offense. No, I'm leaving the elevator out of this. The eyes went pretty wide. Then the discussion moved on. 
The discussion moved on how big and how ugly these signs were and how it would not make the courthouse look good. And basically, I don't think we're going to see 30-06 signs. I even gave him a bone. I told him, and I explained, right now, 30-07 and open carry are not covered by the law that prohibits them from posting off-limits locations that are actually not supposed to be posted. And I explained why this was the case. And it's not because people want to throw open carry under the bus. It's because the law that protected concealed carry in these locations passed before there was a section 30-07. And then the bill that created 30-07 was passed with such a narrow deadline. Uh, I mean, it passed just, just before there was no chance of passing it. But there was not time to properly amend it to give protection to open carry where there was protection for concealed carry. I told him, look, you do that, you're not going to face a fine yet, but there is intent to add it in the next legislative session. I have ideas for the next le- legislative session, and I need to share those with some folks. One of them, I, one of these ideas I'm calling commissioners, not commissars. But when you get right down to it, the truth of the matter is, the attorney general's office is going to be very busy. And by very busy, I mean super busy. There are a lot of courthouses, especially in our area, that are just basically throwing the bird to the legislature when it comes to off-limits locations. And there's two responses. You further refine and strengthen the law that prohibits the posting of locations that are not statutorily off-limits, or you remove the restrictions on places that are statutorily off-limits. I'm a big fan of option C. Option C is both. You see, I'm a big fan of making it harder for the states, or not states, for the counties to do this. And I'm a big fan of removing their ability to do it all together. And it didn't come out the way I planned it, but let me explain. You strike, you make uh, Texas Penal Code sections 4603 and 46035 apply for the most part to unlicensed carry altogether. You take places that are off limits, such as courthouses and courtrooms, out of the equation. You might add some language where if someone is a defendant or a plaintiff in the court, then they're unlo- then they're unable to carry, you know. You might add that if that's what it takes to get the bill passed. For somebody that's just in there to be in there, they have no restriction to be in there. As far as if they're legal to be in there without a gun, then they're legal to be in there with a gun. Then, and this is where it's going to get really interesting, then you sit down and on the signs for fine or the fines for signs law, you create a provision where there is a, basically, where there's an individual, uh, where you can actually take action as an individual. In other words, the attorney general would have so many days to initiate action against Gaines County if they go through with posting against concealed carry. And when Gaines County posts against concealed carry, then you would go through, you'd send the notice to the, uh, to the county judge. The county judge would look at it. File 13 it if that's what he wishes to do. Take action if he prefers to avoid it going any further. And if they don't do anything, then you go ahead, you file with the Attorney General's office. Let's say the Attorney General's office is still dealing with this huge backlog. Well, once the Attorney General's office has got a certain period of time, say give them 90 days, if the signs are still up after 90 days, I think it should be 30, but... It'll probably get watered down to 90 days. If the signs are still up after 90 days, then I have an individual cause for action. And I can call up an attorney. And let's say I call up an attorney and say, hey, Kings County Courthouse has this uh, signage. What will it take to get get you to uh, file a civil suit against them for posting improperly? And then instead of it being $1,000 for the first day and $10,000 for every day thereafter, Maybe we have one posting, or maybe we have one big fine, where once they are given notice by the attorney, hey, you're fixing to be sued, you have, let's give them 10 days to correct it. It'll probably get watered down to 30, but look, let's say they get 30 days to correct it, and they still don't have it corrected. Then my attorney goes in, the lawsuit's, uh, the lawsuit proceeds, and every day after that initial 30-day period of correction opportunity, uh, the first day, let's say it's still $1,000. But you know what? Let's cut it in half. Let's say it's $500 because I'm not the state of Texas. And each subsequent day, let's say it's 
5000 to 7500 half of what the state would get for each one. Well, there's three sides. After 31 days, I would have, I would have uh, cost them uh, over half a million dollars for four signs as a minimum. You see where this is going? It'd be cheaper for, the, for them to face a private cause of action, but it'd still be as expensive as, a pot, as you could imagine. I mean, it'd still be super expensive, and the attorney general's office would not be overwhelmed. The attorney general's office would suddenly be, man, you know what, we're not going to worry about this because Charles Cotton's going to take care of Houston and C.J. Grisham will take care of his uh, counties. And then uh, this little t- small-time podcaster, I can't remember his name, that's over in Gaines County, he'll take care of, uh, he'll take care of them, and he may even turn his sights onto the surrounding counties afterwards. And here's the deal. Maybe I don't get all that money. Maybe, maybe, I, get, maybe I get 10% of it. The attorney is allowed to collect as much as 15 to 25% of it, and maybe the rest of it goes into the crime victims fund. A private cause of action is a miraculous thing to deal with because it would suddenly make these courts, or not courts, but these commissioners' courts, very afraid of posting signage that's invalid. But let's move on from there. After we have this law passed, you're still going to have courts that, well, we'll take our chances. Or commissioner's court settled to say, we'll take our chances. How do you deal with them? Well, you make them individually responsible too. And the way you do that, you provide a mechanism in the law where individual members of a governing body or a government agency that are responsible for any decision to post property improperly to wrongfully exclude a license holder are individually liable. So here's what happens. You take, and let's say you have a Let's say you got five people on the commissioner's court. Three people vote, yes, we're going to, we're going, you know, commissioners for precincts one, three, and four say they vote, yes. And I'm just make, using random numbers here. Hard to do random when you only have four numbers, but I chose two as the number I was going to exclude. Let's say commissioners for precincts one, three, and four vote yes to post the courthouse after this law's gone into effect. Well, the county judge goes out and he buys the signs or he signs the order to pay for the signs and the signs are brought in. He says, okay, put them up. At this point, commissioners for precincts one, three, and four, along with the county judge are individually liable as well as the county. And what does an individual face? Well, each day the signs are up. doesn't make sense for an individual. So let's just say it's a $10,000 one-time fine for each sign. Each sign is a $10,000 fine. Do you think that would get their attention? They would individually be paying on a courthouse like the one here in Gaines County where you have three main entrances and then you have a entrance with an elevator for the disabled or the handicapped. They would be paying for somebody to buy a cheap house or a small car. Think about that. This isn't the county that'd be paying for this. This is the commissioner or the county judge or... Maybe it's the police officer that knows this law or knows this posting is illegal and he's still going to arrest somebody for crossing it because you put a provision in for the enforcement too. Now that will probably get stripped out in the legislative process, but you put it in there so that you have the ability to push it and then you, you can negotiate that out later. Essentially you're doing the, okay, I'm willing to compromise instead of taking, instead of taking your whole cake. I'm only going to take half. And this is what we need to tell the gun banners because that's what they've been telling us. But then you have this provision where you have individual liability, individual causes of action, and then you have causes of action for the attorney general and liability for the governing body or the state agency. I'm thinking I'm thinking a lot of these signs would go away pretty quickly. Courts would probably get filled up with uh, anti-gun sign postings. <laughs> and by a long shot, I do believe. But I also think the problems would seriously go away. You'd have a very, you have a quite a few very unhappy county commissioners. You'd have a very uh, large number of unhappy city council members. You'd have a lot of unhappy police chiefs. Why would the police chiefs be unhappy? They and their officers would be individually responsible if they enforce a unlawfully posted sign. But at the same time, they have to deal with their city managers 
who will tell them, you enforce this or you don't have a job. And they'll be saying, well, if I enforce this, I'm going to need another job. In the end, you will remove a lot of opposition to lawful carry. But you know what? Let's move on. Let's touch on something else real quick. A lot of places are posting 30-06 signs that would never have posted them before. This is partially because they're posting 30-07 signs. A lot of these 30-07 signs are improper. I've seen two 30-07s in Gaines County since uh, open carry has become law. These two have been in Seminole. I really don't spend much time in Seagraves. These two signs are at Seminole. One's on a retail business and the other's on a bank. The one that's on a bank is printed on a single sheet of 8.5 by 11 paper. I believe it has the correct language. I really didn't pay attention to the language because once I realized the sign did not meet the statutory requirements for size, it was eh, whatever, and it's only in English. There is no Spanish portion to the sign. Then the retail outlet here in Seminole that has it, and by here in Seminole I mean here in Gaines County in Seminole, the retail outlet in Seminole that has it has a valid language, I believe, a circle with a uh, slash through it covering a gun, and then they have a Spanish language one. And that's all good, except each one of these is the English portions printed on one eight and a half by 11. The circle with a gun and a slash through it is printed on another eight and a half by 11. And the Spanish portion is printed on an eight and a half by 11. All these are printed on eight and a half by 11 pages. Well, what does that mean? That means this sign's invalid too. It doesn't meet statutory requirements for one inch height letters. But none of these businesses have posted a 30 out 6. To my knowledge, there's one invalid 30 out 6 in Gaines County. There are no valid ones, to my knowledge. The issue we run into with all these 30 out 6 signs popping up, what do we do about them? Do we boycott the business? Do we stomp our feet and hold our breath? Well, I want to give you a plan of action. When there's a business posting a posting to prevent carry of any kind, let them know they are five to six times more likely to be attacked in a criminal act by a police officer than someone licensed to carry a handgun. Their signs are only going to keep the law abiding out. The sign that prevents people from legally carrying a firearm, the signs that prevent somebody from legally carrying a firearm, eats up a lot of real estate in their windows. You let them know this. Then you explain to them, every time I go shopping at your competitor, I want to save that receipt. And then every so often, I want to send this package of receipts to you to let you know how much money you're missing from your competitor. And in some ways, I'll appreciate that because they want to go check their competitor's prices because you're doing it for them. And you're letting them know what people are buying. But at the same time, they're going to be looking at this. This is money we could have had. And this big, ugly sign that's eating up a lot of our window real estate that we could be putting ads in or we could be putting other required notices in. These signs are costing us money. Here's five hundred dollars that I could that I could have, and that sign cost it for me. Think about it. Maybe call the business when you're in the parking lot and ask the ask them to send the manager out. Explain to them that you cannot go into uh, that uh, they have a sign posted on the front door or at the entrance that tells you you're not welcome in their business, and you're going to respect their sign, but you really do need to talk to their manager about it, so could he please step outside? Maybe you need to talk to your, maybe you need to talk to their corporate office if they have one. If it's a mom and pop deal, I'm willing to bet they'll, they're more than willing to take that sign down after a little while. But the thing is, you need to do it politely. You need to do it friendly. You need to give them alternatives. Explain to them, look, I understand that you don't want open carry in your business. You deal with a lot of people that have been traumatized and you don't want people carrying a, a firearm that's visible. I understand that. You can leave the 30 out 7 up, take the 30 out 6 down. I will bring my business back because now you're just saying no shoes, no shirt, no concealment, no service. If they take the 30 out 7 down and leave the 30 out 6 up, tell them I will shop here. You're just basically saying don't tuck in, don't hide anything under your clothes that's. Uh, that's not there to hide other body parts. And guess what? You're throwing them a bone. You're explaining to them you're willing to accept some limitation. Now, some people are like, well, if they're not going to allow open carry, I'm not going to go in that business. Or if they're not going to allow concealed carry, I'm not going to go in that business. No, don't look at it that way. Look at it as you're, you're going to show them that by allowing you in there, nothing bad will happen. 
give them a little while. Maybe, maybe give them six months, maybe a year. And you say, you see, I've been shopping in here. I've been carrying openly or concealed. Everything's good. You haven't had to worry about me. Why don't you take down that other sign? Nothing bad happened on the last one. Take down the other one. I guarantee you nothing bad will happen there either. And you can throw up another, you can throw up another poster for the weekly ad in that space. And they're going to be far more likely to listen to you if you do that. With that said, I think it's time we uh, go ahead and do the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with the podcast. And then we'll hit the news and we'll wrap the show up. Now, I'm thinking I'll probably get this episode out sometime Tuesday morning. I don't know for a fact. But here's the contact info. After that, we'll hit the news. We'll sign the show off. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. And we're back for the news. As I said, uh, it's going to irritate, what did I call her? Hmm. Sandy. It's going to irritate Sandy. I've only taken two of her news stories. It's almost like a game between us. The, she, uh, she creates this big old long list. She, she even creates categories for them. And she, uh, she uh, kind of likes to see what I pair out and what I keep. You know, I've kind of wrapped up the topic with uh, signs for guns and businesses. And that kind of ties into intentionally into the news that I chose to use. Our first story is about the owner of a barbecue joint called Brooks Place in Houston. Now, Trent Brooks said it was a business decision to reward customers who were legally carrying handguns with a 10% discount. I think this will probably work out very well for him. He might lose one or two, but he's probably going to gain quite a few. But you notice he didn't ban guns. Now, there is another article where there's some confusion how businesses licensed to sell alcohol for off-premises consumption here in Texas are supposed to deal with open carry. Now, some businesses have simply opted to post 30-07 signs. Some are assuming that anyone carrying a handgun is doing so legally, and others are asking customers to show their license. Now, here in Texas, the policy that Walmart is operating under puts them in the latter category. I do have to say, when I was in their Seminole location earlier this week, no one asked me for my license. I even dealt with one of, the, one of their employees at a service counter. Nobody asked me for my license. The employee I dealt with, me and him actually discussed discussed uh, him getting his license. I gave him a quick rundown of how to get it, and he can pretty much figure safely that I was legally carrying as it was. But I had to run in to get an SD card or a micro SD card for a device that failed. I was out in the field. I needed another card, and I didn't have time to go get a cover garment or a holster that was inside the waistband. I just had the gun that I was openly carrying. And instead of locking it up like I would have before January 1st, I just went ahead and carried it in to the Walmart anyway. Went in, got what I needed, and paid out and left. No fuss, no muss. Some people say, well, Walmart has no authority to demand your license. No, they don't. But they have no obligation to let you in their store if you don't show it either. They can throw you out of there. They can tell you don't carry openly in here. Don't bring a gun in my store. And you know what? They have that right. They don't want to do that. They want. They just want to make sure that you're legal to carry so that uh, they're comfortable that they won't lose their TABC license. With that said, let me just say I want to. I want everybody to carry safely, carry responsibly, and be polite, be courteous, be professional. We have to show up before I hit the sign-off music. Stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.